Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Matt for the Remnant Forum. Wanted to start off with a little housekeeping note. Please be advised that the brand new Remnant TV platform is pretty much complete over at our website. And what this means is that every program that Remnant TV produces will be placed simultaneously on YouTube and at remnantnewspaper.com. So that those of you who'd rather not view us on YouTube with all the advertisements and so forth can now watch all of our stuff uh, in the peace and Catholic quiet of our website. So please keep that in mind. We're already being played on, on places like Gloria TV. We're so grateful to our friends at, at Gloria TV for running Remnant TV for us. That's wonderful. And in the weeks, of, weeks ahead, we also want to move on to Vimeo. The whole idea is to get you know, Remnant TV out there far and wide as possible. So we're already all over, I think, yeah, we're over a million views now on, on YouTube and elsewhere, and we're really very happy about that and really grateful to you, the viewers, for sharing the videos. It's really important if you could continue to share with your friends and family our videos. That really helps get those numbers up. It helps us when we get to the point of beginning to, to solicit advertisements and try to support uh, Remnant TV through, through advertisements. It really helps to have high numbers. So continuing to share those videos is just the best way to do it, and we're very grateful. We just couldn't, you know, obviously Remnant TV couldn't survive with, without you. And so, again, thank you so much. You might see a little bit of a dip in the YouTube view count now as we make this move over to both YouTube and Remnant TV at our website. But please don't panic. We're not going under. We're actually growing up a little bit. Uh, this only means that there are now folks watching Remnant TV and five other venues, including right there on our own website. So we want to get these programs out on a weekly basis. Uh, we've got a lot of ideas. As I say, we're going to start the, the remnant. Uh, we already have started the Sunday sermons from South St. Paul, which have been a real big hit so far. Uh, a lot of other ideas that we have. We're also going we're right now in the planning stages of doing a live streaming broadcast, which is pretty ambitious for us. Live streaming broadcast on a weekly basis that will include real-time callers. So it'll be a call-in program. Uh, you know, with, with all the bells and whistles. We're well into the planning stages of that. Probably towards the, towards the beginning of the new year is when we're going to launch that. So support us if you can. I think there might be some funding and donation options that are available here on the screen. Go right ahead and make, make use of those. Take advantage of those. If you'd like to see more Remnant TV come out on a more regular basis, which is what we hope to do, uh, please support us. I've got a lot of guests lined up, including my buddy Chris Ferrara, of course, for that live streaming program. So things are looking really good. Uh, you know, before they come and, and shut us down or throw us in prison or do whatever it is they're going to do with those who follow Christ in the days ahead, uh, rest assured that our plan here at The Remnant and at Remnant TV is just to stand up and shout uh, louder and longer and with more enthusiasm than ever before, more aggressively than ever before from these housetops against the Christophobes, against those who hate the Catholic Church and hate the family and so forth. So we really hope you'll stick with us. And again, we appreciate the fact that you've stuck with us so far and sort of made this thing into already a pretty nice little success. Thanks be to God, it's working out pretty well. So today's show, we wanted to talk about Pope Francis, who is uh, hell-bent on destroying, not destroying, I mean rather reforming the church, as he puts it. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an address that he gave on November 10th, when he, he met in Florence, Italy, with the, uh, the Fifth National Ecclesial Convention, to discuss Jesus Christ, the new humanism. And I, I, I know, I, you know, sometimes I think no more programs about Pope Francis, but I mean, every time, every week, something else happens that just makes it almost impossible for us to ignore uh, really with, with the, the, the sad tragedy that is the pontificate of Pope Francis. Um, and in this particular 49-minute speech to over 2,000 delegates from, from a couple of hundred, of, uh, hundred Italian dioceses, you know, Francis came out and said the Catholics need to realize, quote, we are not living in an era of change, but a change of era, end quote, which to me just sounds like something right out of the old Obama administration playbook for hope and change. And then he, he, Francis goes on blasting conservatives again in conservatism as having no legitimate role in reforming the church, warning against a faith, locked in subjectivism, as he calls it. So again, I, I don't understand why Francis doesn't realize that when he attacks conservatism, he's attacking his friends, he's attacking potential converts, he's attacking pro-life, pro-family people all across the world, and yet with a complete abandon, he keeps going after conservatives and conservatism. Don't understand it. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. Uh, it, you know, he, he casts conservatism in, in this, this, this light, equating it with fundamentalism, which is the new thing which we need to watch out for because the far left is already talking about religious fundamentalism, religious supremacy, which is another form of what they're sort of beginning to move all of that into the white supremacy sort of hate, hate speech, hate group 
uh, category. And Francis is not helping when he comes out blasting conservative Catholics as fundamentalists, you know, as being, being uh, you know, guilty of fundamentalism, words that are used by the far left all the time. Uh, in their, their little hate-mongering campaigns, and yet Francis doesn't seem to care. He also, in the same speech, he returns to his favorite multi-syllabic word, Pelagianism, which he says prompts the church not to be humble, selfless, and blessed, uh, end quote, how anyone could believe that this man who seems to be at all-out war with the Catholic Church is humble, is truly beyond me, how anyone can be buying that anymore. Uh, but in any case, the conservative Pelagian Gnostic approach, according to Francis, brings us confidence, quote, in structures, organizations, in perfect planning because it's abstract, he says, but it leads to a controlling, hard, regulatory style. And then he goes on, in facing ills or the problems of the church, it is useless to look for solutions in conservatism, in the restoration of practices and outdated forms that even culturally aren't able to be meaningful. What he means by practices and outdated forms that are no longer meaningful, God only knows, but I suppose it might mean the mass, I suppose it might mean dogma, teaching, teaching catechism and so forth. So, so the Holy Father is, is attacking, obviously, in, in this speech, I'm sorry to bring it to you again if you haven't seen it, but he's attacking those who at the close of the Synod on the Family, we were in Rome and we heard him close that synod by basically throwing a fit uh, against those who he accused of trying to indoctrinate, his word, indoctrinate, since when is indoctrinate a four-letter word, but it's now a bad word, indoctrinate, and he said, hurl stones at others. He, he accused us of having closed hearts, which frequently hide behind the church's teaching or good intentions, in order to sit in the chair of Moses and lodge, sometimes with superiority and superficiality, difficult cases and wounded families with conspiracy theories and blinkered viewpoints." End quote. I, I can't even imagine that ever in the history of the papacy there is a pope who used this sort of schoolyard terminology, this sort of, this sort of bully tactics that he is now using. He's attacking those folks, he's attacking the conservatives, he's going after the capitalists, whatever he means by that, and then he moves on to what seems like an outright attack on doctrine itself when he says, quote, Christian doctrine is not a closed system incapable of generating questions, doubts, and interrogatives, but is alive. It has a face that is not rigid, it has a body that moves and grows, it has a soft flesh, it is called Jesus Christ, end quote. I'm at a loss for words, so I'm going to bring my friend Chris Ferraro, who joins us from his home, home in Virginia. Chris, where do we begin? I want to ask you a couple of questions about this bizarre address. And you know, I want to ask you, you know, does this mean that Catholic doctrine is no longer unchanging? Uh, and when the Holy Father talks about meeting the challenges of our time, what does that mean? Since when does the church not meet the challenges of, the, of any given time? And I also want to ask you, Chris, what does, what do you think Francis actually means by this Pelagianism that he keeps accusing everyone of? And finally, what do Francis and Casper and the rest actually mean by Holy Communion being a font of mercy and forgiveness, which is what they keep doing? Uh, sort of acting as though, like the old teaching in the Catechism was, if you were in venial sin, you go to communion, and the grace of communion could, could remove those sins. Now the, the attitude is that mortal sins, public adul adultery, for example, can be sort of removed by going to communion, and then if we somehow say, you, you know, that folks in mortal sin, public sinners can't go to communion still, as the Catechism teaches, we're being intolerant, we're lacking in mercy, and so forth. This is the attitude. So they're skipping confession altogether, which is obviously the means of, of gaining forgiveness for sin. And they're going right to communion, saying everyone needs to come to communion so that we can all be fed uh, the bread of the Lord and, 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 be uh, and benefit from his mercy. So first, first, Chris, Christian doctrine is not a closed system, says the Holy Father, incapable of generating questions, doubts, and interrogatives. Now, that, does this mean that Catholic doctrine is no longer unchanging? What say you? Well, it's the same old story. We've had this program shoved in our faces for the better part of three years now. And it's basically the program of a liberal, rather radical Jesuit stuck in a time warp. He's still back in the 1970s, employing the basic tools of, I have to say this frankly, the liberal Jesuit modernist. 
What are these tools? Well, rhetorically speaking, we're dealing with two things. First, we're dealing with the false antithesis. Francis is a master of the false antithesis. You pit one thing against another in order to discredit the thing that you wish to discredit. So on the one hand, he'll talk about mercy, uh, caressing, accompaniment, and on the other, doctrine, as if the two things are opposed. The other is category confusion. So he'll talk about communion in the context of communion being a place where people receive forgiveness. No, actually, confession is where you receive forgiveness. And the point of that is to confuse the two categories so that people will think the church is cruelly denying forgiveness to those who are barred from receiving Holy Communion because they're in a state of mortal sin and have not been absolved in the confessional. So by these two techniques, uh, working like some kind of sulfuric acid on the joints and ligaments of the church, he's busily dissolving everything in his path. And I have to say, Mike, he's having a great time doing it. Go to the National Geographic interview. One of his friends, a cardinal whose name escapes me, quoted him uh, in, as answering the question, well, why are you smiling now all the time? His answer was, it's very entertaining to be the Pope. He's having a blast. Now, what do you say about a Pope who thinks it's fun to be the Pope? I say we have a Pope who's very alarming, who doesn't really understand what he is and what he is supposed to be doing as the Vicar of Christ. So we're getting instead the vision of Francis and Evangelii Gaudium. And in the speech on November 10th to the conference, the Episcopal Conference in Italy, or the Convention of the Hierarchical Members, Bishops, Priests, Brothers, and Sisters, he links that speech to Evangelii Gaudium, which is a, a truly bizarre personal manifesto. Cardinal Burke said he can't even figure out where it belongs, whether it's even part of the magisterium, because it's full of his rather strange personal reflections. And basically his call to change, I'm not exaggerating here, literally everything in the world and the church. A new this, a new that, a new everything. On and on and on, Evangelii Gaudium goes and he carries forward that theme in this address to the Italian hierarchy using these two rhetorical tools of the false antithesis and the confusion between categories and his two favorite words, Pelagianism and Gnosticism. Yeah, well, Chris, why don't we talk about that for a minute? Because I, I think there's just a tremendous amount of discouragement that that, that, that people are experiencing now with this pre, with this with this pope. I know I'm discouraged, and you know he goes back to these words like Pelagians and Gnostics and so forth. He he himself seems to have something of a struggle. Either he's intentionally, uh, you know, applying them, you know, sort of willy nilly, or he has a sort of incomplete understanding of these terms. What do you think, before we even go any further, what, what do you think Francis actually means when he comes out and calls well, us all Pelagians let, let, and Gnostics and so forth? Well, let, let, let's talk about it. First of all, he begins his speech with his theme from Evangelii Gaudium, quoting himself, I prefer a church, he prefers it, which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out in the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and clinging to its own security. I do not want a church. He doesn't want it. I do not want a church concerned with being at the center and which then ends by being caught up in a web of obsessions and procedures. So here we see the deployment of the classic modernist trick of the false alternative. Uh, you have, in order to have a church which really matters to people, it has to be bruised, hurting, and dirty and be out on the streets rather than be concerned about its own security. See, there's security for the church on the one hand, and then there's the church of the people on the other hand. That's a false alternative. It is the very security of the church in her infallible moral and, and religious teachings and in her ancient rituals, which are ever ancient and ever new, as St. Augustine said. It's in these things that the church provides really meaningfully for the needs of the faithful and leads them to eternal salvation. What does he mean when he talks about a church that's dirty? The church is the spotless bride of Christ. It's her very spotlessness that makes her attractive to men. It isn't the business of the church to get down and dirty in the streets. This is nonsensical, radical, liberal, Jesuit rhetoric from the 1970s. Enough of this nonsense. Then he goes on to talk about Pelagianism. Here's what he says Pelagianism is. Pelagianism brings us to have faith in structures, organizations, and perfect plans because they are abstract. No, it isn't. That's not what Pelagianism is. Pelagius, Pelagius was a 5th century heretic who denied that original sin was transmitted to all men, who denied that uh, salvation can only be effected through the 
uh, transformation of man into a state of grace by the, opera by the operation of divine grace, who said that man can save himself by his own efforts, although his good works are assisted by grace. It's a classic heresy of the 5th century that has nothing to do with structures, organizations, or plans. And the church needs structure, organization, and plans. Christ founded a church, and he gave it a structure, and he gave it a plan, which is to make disciples of all nations. And the church has carried out that plan through the organization of Episcopal sees, dioceses, parishes, works of sodality, hospitals, the vast array of structures. That's what the church is all about. It's a visible, structured institution. What in heaven's name is this man talking about? It certainly has nothing to do with the, her the heresy of Pelagius. You know, Chris, he talks about meeting the challenges of our world all the time, and that seems to involve, in his opinion, tearing everything down like you're talking about, whether it's his own residence. And we were, <laughs> we were in, in Rome for the Synod, and you know, our camera crew actually went to the gates where the Santa Marta is, in the, the area where, the, where his home is, where he, where he resides. And we asked a Swiss guard, we said, we'd like to go in. People back in the States, they, uh, they have no idea what the Pope's house looks like. Is there any way we can go in and snap a picture? Absolutely not. You can't. The, actually, the Swiss guard said, if you want to see what Santa Marta looks like, you got to go up to the top of the dome of St. Peter's, and then you can look down over the Vatican Gardens, and you can see where the Pope lives. <laughs> I'm just thinking, this is the Pope of the people, the great, humble, holy father. I mean, he's locked himself away, so I don't know why he's done this, but it just seems like the, the game plan is to tear down everything. So even walking into St. Peter's for a tourist or for a pilgrim, is no longer the same. You don't have the comfort and the consolation of seeing the Holy Father's apartment. You don't know where he is because they've changed everything. And didn't this all begin really, you know, a long time ago? It began with tearing out the, you know, the high altars and the communion rails and everything. We're just seeing the logical sort of progression of that, just the destruction of everything. And now they've moved on to morality as well and they're tinkering with that. Isn't that basically what they've been doing here? Well, we've said it before, and we've said it in writing and on this show, that we've reached the end point of a trajectory, and let no one think that Francis is the entire problem here. He's just bringing to a conclusion this downward trajectory into disaster for the church. Not that the church will be destroyed, the church will survive in spite of Francis, in spite of all the trends of the past 50 years, but think about it. First they wrecked the liturgy, then they stopped traditional evangelization, replaced it with ecumenism, dialogue, and interreligious dialogue. Conversions ceased. The number of faithful began to plummet. The number of priests began to plummet. Having wrecked the liturgy, having wrecked evangelization, having destroyed vocations, now they're after morality. And, the, and, and he, he has the, the audacity to talk of people who defend the moral code that the church has always defended for 2,000 years, which is the code laid down for us by our Lord Jesus Christ, especially when it concerns the divorce and remarriage. He has the nerve to equate that with sitting in the chair of Moses. It was Moses who tolerated divorce out of the hardness of people's hearts. And it was our Lord who said, it was never so. You were allowed to violate the divine and natural law because of the hardness of your heart. Now, as, as, uh, as Bishop Athanasius Schneider and others have observed, we're heading back to a kind of neo-Mosaic, neo-pagan scenario where all of the gains of the Christian centuries are being reversed by a pope who seems determined to destroy it all. I mean, his own words indict him. Listen to what he says about doctrine in the context of his uh, obviously erroneous understanding of Pelagianism. He talks about the Pelagian as someone who looks at Christian doctrine as, and you mentioned this before, a closed system. Of course it's a closed system. The truth has been proclaimed. It's not up for grabs. It, this, the truth is clearly stated by the teachings of the church in her infallible magisterium especially such teachings as whoever marries, uh, puts away his wife and marries another commits adultery. That's a closed system as, as he would have it, a truth that does not change. But he says Christian doctrine should be able to generate questions, doubts, and inquiries. Really? Doctrine is supposed to be generating doubts in the minds of the faithful? Then he goes on with the classic modernist false alternative, or rather in this case, a category confusion. Doctrine, he says, is alive. It knows being unsettled. It does not have a rigid face. It has a body that moves and grows. It, is, it has a soft flesh. It is called Jesus Christ. So we have here the false, the false antithesis between Christ and doctrine and the category confusion between the incarnation and the eternal word that is incarnated. The eternal word was with God from the very beginning. 
the word was proclaimed to us by the incarnate word in the person of Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity. But Christ is not identical with the teachings of the church such that we can discard the doctrines and just look at Christ, gaze at him with some kind of a stupid imitation of beatitude and not care what he teaches. He came to proclaim doctrines in words which we obey when we hear them. Yeah, yeah. And the church hands them down as definite propositions. Doctrine is not the flesh of Christ. Yeah. This is nonsense. No, no, it is, Chris. And boy, they've been using that a lot lately. I don't know if you saw the interview of Raymond Arroyo and Cardinal Whirl recently, but he was, he, well, he's like a snake to begin with, but he kept doing that to Raymond. He kept looking at Raymond, no matter what Raymond would say with respect to, we have to follow the rules. There is, you can't have divorce and remarried, receiving the sacraments. He would go back to this idea of coming to Christ. And he would just say it in such a simple way. We've got to come to Christ, bring people to Christ. And it's just this ridiculous, you know, sort of, sort of uh, pandering or whatever you would call that. Uh, it doesn't seem genuine at all. And basically what they're saying is come to Christ. We're really holy. We're on the high ground. And those of you who are, want to follow the rules are not following Christ. So there's this implicit in, in, sort of indictment also of those who are saying, here's a catechism. Here's what I got to do to save my soul. If you're saying that, you're not coming to Christ. You're being intransigent. You're keeping people out. You're not showing love and mercy. This is diabolical, Chris. <clears throat> well, it's the, old, it's the old modernist trick. You constantly invoke Christ in the process of suggesting that everyone simply disregard what Christ taught us. That's what this synod was all about. Oh, we must look upon the face of Christ. Excuse me, but it was Christ who said that he who puts away his wife and marries another commits adultery. What, we're supposed to be looking at Christ while forgetting his teaching? He came to give us his teaching. Again, it's the false antithesis between Christ and doctrine and the category confusion between the flesh of Christ and the propositions he gave to us as his revealed truth, spoken in words so that men would hear them, understand, and obey. This is classic modernist double talk. This speech lays out a program for a classic modernist style subversion of doctrine and everything in its path, in, in, in exchange for which we get this nebulous vision, which he himself says he's not in a position to tell you how to elaborate. He says, in the end, uh, it doesn't fall to me to explain to you how to realize this dream, but I leave it to you, the faithful and your pastors. That's an entree to what apparently is coming in the apostolic exhortation, which is going to be something I call regional truth. He's going to tell the bishops, the local Episcopal conferences, to do as you will, respecting the traditional discipline of the church regarding admission of the divorced and remarried to Holy Communion and other disciplinary questions as well. He's been saying this now incessantly. He wants a synodal church. Did you know we have a synodal church, Mike? The church has been Rome-centric, Rome, Rome centered on the Sea of Peter, and its ecumenical councils for 2,000 years. Now suddenly it's a synodal church, the latest novelty. Yeah, you know, you, you talk about sort of the conflating of doctrines and, and, and just kind of uh, the, the, the nebulous ambiguity that they're so skilled at using. Have you noticed this, Chris, where they, they, they all of a sudden are talking about, I mean, we already know what they did to baptism by introducing evolution and so forth, and that's just fine, and suddenly, suddenly Genesis is myth, and pretty soon do you even need baptism? Was there actually an Adam and Eve and so forth? So you see that sacrament sort of falling by the wayside. And now you have this strange attitude. Cardinal Casper has done it. The Holy Father has done it where they act as though going to communion, receiving communion for the divorced and remarried, that's where they're going to go to the font of mercy. That's where they're going to go for, to, be, to be forgiven. They don't bring up the sacrament of confession for some reason, Chris. All I can figure is it's because they know darn well no one has worked out the process whereby mercy and forgiveness can be obtained more than the Catholic Church has. Well, first of all, the, their slogan is communion is for sinners. It's, it's not a reward for the good. Uh, actually, no. Communion is designed to keep us away from sin. We go to confession. We're restored to the state of grace if we make a good confession. And the purpose of communion is, is to sustain us in that state so we don't fall again into sin. Communion is not the place where you receive forgiveness, although venial sins are remitted from the reception of Holy Communion. Communion is the place where you maintain the state of grace after having received absolution in the confessional. Again, Modernist category confusion. When you want to obscure one thing, you talk about another. When you want to get rid of confession, you talk about communion as the place where you're forgiven. That isn't the place where you're forgiven. 
That's the place where you avoid sin through the spiritual nourishment of the Holy Eucharist. That's what maintains you in the state of grace after you receive absolution in the confessional. This is nothing but deliberate obfuscation, which is the mark of modernist speech and modernist writing. They continually obfuscate with an aim in mind, however. The aim in mind is, as St. Pius X says, to corrupt everything they touch with their obscurantism, from the liturgy to the preaching of the church about the necessity of conversion, and now even to basic moral questions, such as whether adulterers can receive Holy Communion. And this, this Christ that Francis equates with doctrine, as if the flesh of Christ were doctrine, as if the flesh of Christ, which changes the way all flesh does, means that doctrine changes, now they're going to use this notion to overturn even what John Paul II taught a mere 34 years ago in Familiaris Consortio, and what Benedict taught in 2007, echoing John Paul II, that people who live in a state of adultery because they claim to have married another while their valid marriage persists cannot receive Holy Communion because it's a sacrilege, an objective offense against the sacrament itself, and a grave injury to the common good of the church. Now this false notion of doctrine, which he equates with the flesh of Christ that grows and moves and changes, is going to get rid of the teaching of John Paul II and Benedict and every one of their predecessors on such an important question. And what does that mean, Mike? If this happens, if he comes out with an apostolic exhortation, a post-synodal apostolic exhortation that invites the bishops' conferences to allow sacrilegious communion on the part of those living in second and even third marriages, You've destroyed the Catholic faith. It's that simple. Because if someone in the state of mortal sin can receive Holy Communion, then what becomes of Holy Communion? It's just a Protestant bread and wine ritual. And what becomes of confession? Confession is abandoned. Why go to confession any longer? If, if you can receive Holy Communion while living in adultery, that would apply to any other habitual sinner. Well, I can't overcome my sin. I'm really sorry about it. I'll try under the law of graduality to be better, but I'll just receive Holy Communion anyway. And, and then what happens is the church becomes essentially a high Anglican offshoot. You know, if, and if you think back, Chris, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, I just wish people could connect the dots here. I mean, look what happened physically to the confessionals and the Catholic churches for the past 50 years. This is, Francis is, is taking it to high, to high gear here, to the next level. He's ratcheting it up. But this has been such a long time coming. And I'm so tired of people acting as though this is some sort of a traditionalist canard or traditionalist holdout position. It's not, Chris. They've torn apart the sanctuaries. They ripped out those confessionals. They're gone. The, the, mo the modern process of hearing confessions is so ridiculous. You don't know where it's going to be, if you're going to be sitting, facing, what's going to be happening. So this isn't some, some imaginary thing. It's not something that just happened yesterday. They, they haven't been talking about mortal sin from the, from the pulpit in decades for the most part the vast majority of priests have given up on that so you can really see a pattern here chris where i don't think that anyone can accuse us of exaggerating they've torn all these bastions of our faith down and now they're coming out and lecturing the few people who are still following the rules and there aren't many of those left most people have left the church and now they're lecturing the few as pelagian and gnostic who are still following the rules chris this is I'm sorry, this just seems demonic to the core. I, I don't know how else to, 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 to look at uh, this. It, it's absolutely frightening, and more and more people are waking up. I, I see things on the blogs that are so harsh regarding this pope. I can't even repeat them on the air, and they're not coming from traditionalists. People are saying, who is this man, and what does he think he's doing? You mentioned Gnosticism. That's the other of the two temptations he re referred to in his November 10th address. He said there are two temptations against this wonderful, ever-reforming church. One is Pelagianism, which I just mentioned. The other is Gnosticism. Listen to his attempt to define Gnosticism. Gnosticism, he says, leads to trust in clear and logical reasoning, which, however, has lost the tenderness of the flesh of one's brother. No, it isn't. That's not what Gnosticism is. Gnosticism is not clear and logical reasoning. Gnosticism is the idea that Christ came to impart esoteric knowledge known only to a few by which one is saved and only the initiates can get it because it's so obscure and so difficult to acquire that only the initiates can have it. Well, this is what Francis is promoting, this obscure notion of a faith that goes beyond clear and logical reasoning. And we have here the, the classic, again, once again, the false alternative, clear and logical reasoning on the one hand and the tenderness of the flesh of your brother on the other, 
as if someone who reasons clearly and logically, as the church does in all her teaching, would be unconcerned about the tenderness of the flesh of his brother. This is demagogic rubbish. It's the demagogic rubbish, again, of a liberal Jesuit stuck in a time warp back in the age of the lava lamp, the 1970s. And now he's the, now he's the Pope, and he's spewing out these cliches, these glittering cliches. This is not an era of change. This is the, a change of era. Please, this is, this is utterly silly, and because it's coming from the Vicar of Christ, utterly dangerous and seditious to the commonwealth of the church. No, that's that's it, Chris. You know, and it's like this idea of Gnostic, like we're 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 the keeper of the secret key. You know, and you got to come and come into our group in order to be saved. I mean, when is the last time Pope Francis mentioned the Catechism? What we're doing, what conservative traditional Catholics are doing, is pointing to the massive co collection or body of the Church's moral and 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 uh, you know dogmatic uh, resources and saying there it is. There's the Catechism. There's the rule book. But of course. Pope Francis doesn't mention the Catechism. I mean, I'm not sure. Do you know? Has he mentioned the Catechism of the Catholic Church once? I'm not sure if he has at all. No, he, he doesn't. He doesn't mention the Catechism because, well, that's a, a rigid, enclosed system of doctrine, and that might involve perish the thought, clear and logical reasoning. And this is a pope who is now setting himself up as an anti-intellectual, but he's doing it in a pseudo-intellectual manner. He, he's he's posing as a kind of intellectual here talking about Gnosticism and Pelagianism while defining both of them incorrectly. And he's using, he's using this uh, pseudo-intellectual approach to attack legitimate intellectual endeavors in the church's theology and to attack clear and logical reasoning itself as if the faith were anything but clear and logical. Every doctrine of the faith is a clear and logical consequence of a revealed truth, such as the Immaculate Conception, for example. The church offers a very clear and logical explanation of why Mary must be immaculate, because Christ could not have taken his flesh from a sinner, someone who was ever, even for a moment, under the, the dominion of Satan. And that's a clear and logical teaching. It's, it involves a revealed truth, which is a matter of faith, but if you accept the revealed truth, what the church develops in her theology is always clear and logical. He's attacking clarity, he's attacking logic, he's attacking reason itself, in, in favor of his nebulous, obscurantist, and dare I say, Gnostic idea of the faith as some kind of thing that emerges from within under the influence of the Holy Ghost. And I can't let that go by without comment. He talks about, in, in this speech, allowing oneself to be moved along by the breath of the Holy Spirit. Is he kidding? That synod had nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. It was a Pelagian undertaking from beginning to end. He manipulated it, controlled it, stacked the electorate, wrote all of its documents, and even then he couldn't get what he wanted after all these manipulations, and he exploded in outrage at the end, at the end accusing those who had stood up for the traditional teaching of the church of sitting in the chair of Moses. What did this have to do with the Holy Ghost? Nothing. What did it have to do with the will of Francis in a Pelagian, that is, a human undertaking, trying to get a humanly contrived result, everything. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. We're running out of time a little bit, Chris, but I want you to comment on the Synod. I know you were there covering it. And, uh, you know, there was some division. Some people, I think, walked away from that feeling that, hey, we got a victory there. Francis didn't get everything he wanted. But you and I both know, sitting in the press hall, you know, in, in Rome, that obviously this is, a, like you say, the synodal process, the synodal church. They're going to get to it. But I want you specifically to talk about this idea that I think it was number 84, 85 of uh, paragraph 84, 85, where they talk about, uh, you know, giving greater, greater roles to the divorced and remarried in the life of the church, whether that we, by, by extension, you can, you know, he's talking about godparents, he's talking about maybe having them read the gospel and so forth, or read the, the readings at, at mass and so forth. I mean, Chris, does it really matter at the end of the day if we're talking about, you know, actual uh, reception of the Eucharist for the divorced and remarried, or people playing that kind of a role. Let's say godparents, for example. If they're now to come in, which is what Francis wants, and stand as godparents for children, swearing and taking vows in the name of the child to uphold the teachings of the church, to renounce Satan and all his works and pomps, at the end of the day, what kind of a victory was it, Chris? I don't think it was a victory at all. I think it's, uh, they got pretty much most of what they wanted, and what they didn't get, they'll get at next year's synod. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, when Cardinal Pell says the document is not ambig ambiguous, but then says at the same time it was cleverly written to get consensus, he's double-talking. 
because a document cleverly written to get consensus between opposing camps in the Synod Hall has to be ambiguous. It has to allow both sides to walk away satisfied. The only way you do that, and I speak this way from experience as a lawyer, is to give each side something of what they want, and that was that, that's exactly what was done here. Now, if the document is ambiguous, however, on moral questions, guess what? The side seeking to undermine morality has won by introducing an ambiguity where there wasn't one before. And we don't have to guess what Francis is, is after when in paragraph 84 he talks about greater integration and examining areas in the liturgy, in pastoral work, and in institutional aspects of the church where this inclusion could be accomplished. He said explicitly what he's after in the La Nacion interview. He lit, reeled off a list of seven things that divorced and remarried people can't do, and he explicitly asked, why can't they be godparents? He wants them to be godparents. He wants people living in a state of adultery to stand at the baptismal font and say that they renounce the works of Satan while they're living in a relationship which our Lord himself condemned as adultery. Ah, oh, but we're not supposed to think about what our Lord said. No, we just think about the flesh of Jesus. This is the modernist ruse that he's attempting to pull off here. And I'm sorry if I seem very harsh here. I've had enough. I know a lot of other people have had enough. And it's time to stand up and say, we oppose this entire seditious program. The Pope, who now occupying the throne of Peter, by his own words, has revealed himself to be on a mission, if he can get away with it, to destroy. He wants to destroy the traditional teaching of the church on the divorce and remarried. He belittles doctrine. He, he even rejects conservatism as a whole, likening it to fundamentalism. When the church is by her very nature, by divine institution, a conservative organization that preserves forever what is handed down from the apostles. He makes fun of conservatism. He also says, by the way, in that same passage, that we can't look to conservatism, fundamentalism, or outmoded forms of conduct. So now he's targeting traditional forms of conduct. I assume he means moral behavior. What else could he possibly mean? And I assume he means here what, what he has been obsessed with since he was elected pope, doing for the universal church what he did when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, administering or authorizing the administration of Holy Communion to everybody, regardless of their state, whether or not they're living in a state of adultery as divorced and remarried people, cohabiting, whatever. Communion is for everyone because communion is a communal meal that promotes communion. Yeah, That's how yeah. he sees it. Now you, you think back to one of those one of the early earlier scandals with him where he sort of mocked a young altar boy in St. Peter's for keeping his hands folded together. And you think now now that all makes sense because if he got if he gets his way, like with divorce and remarried sitting in as God or standing as godparents, for example, imagine the scandal for the young people of the church. I mean, they're already so dejected and jaded, they're gone by the time they're in the eighth grade out of this asinine new church that they've created. Imagine how it's gonna be now. When young people will have absolutely no foundation to stand on, when even godparents living in sin get to trot into church and sit there at the font and, and, and assist in baptizing the child. He doesn't, he doesn't seem to even factor that in. They've already lost most of the young people. And, and if they get their way now in the next couple of years, they're going to lose the rest. Well, I've, I've said this before in other contexts. It's like a physician who's malpracticing on his patient. He's administering a certain type of medication, which has put the patient into cardiac arrest. The nurses around him are frantically pleading with him to change his approach, stop administering that medication, find an antidote and do something else. And he insists on doubling the dosage. They want to finish off the patient. They refuse to admit that their entire experiment is a catastrophic failure that dries up vocations and drives people out of the pews. They will not admit it because they're ideologues, which is another irony here. He's constantly talking about not, not allowing the faith to degenerate into an ideology, meaning specific doctrines, clear and logical reasoning, what the church has always taught, while he himself is promoting a vicious and subversive ideology that belittles conservatism, liturgical tradition, disciplinary tradition, anything he doesn't like. And what's frightening about it is not so much that he's doing it, modernists have always done that, but that he's doing it in such a superficial, vindictive and almost childish manner, which indicates someone who really has issues, personality issues that make him even more dangerous than a more subtle modernist who isn't going to make the kinds of moves that Francis seems to think he's entitled to make. Now, having said all that, I think we should try to end on a positive note. A lot of people are staking their entire faith because they've succumbed to this 
hyper uh, ultramontanism of the post conciliar epic on on the pope we have a bad pope they lose their faith that's not what the church is about the pope is a custodian of tradition he is not christ but the vicar of christ a pope can go astray and if he does as popes have done in the past we still have the faith we still have the sacraments we still have good priests we still have a number of good bishops and it's to them and to the eternal faith the faith of our fathers that we go in these times of crisis if francis wants to act like a maniac all he can do is stand up and object to it and ask him to cease that kind of behavior but we don't lose the faith we simply don't follow him when he acts this way when he says these bizarre things which in my opinion are absolutely the worst things that have been uttered in a time that is already beset by revolutionary upheaval in the church this is the worst yet yeah, no, it's the worst yet, Chris, and I think that's a good note uh, on which to conclude today because, you know, I know our state of a conscious friends are going to come in now and ha, 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 and aren't we awesome? We were right from the beginning. You guys are wrong. Really, Chris, it doesn't have anything to do with it. You know, this whole state of a conscious thing, even if Francis weren't the Pope, and I believe that he is, then what? So you win this little silly debate. He's not the Pope. Okay, great. Now you win. You're the best. You were the smartest. You were the most insightful. What does that have to do with anything? This is a spiritual war, Chris. We're all trying to save our souls here. And I, I completely agree with you. Uh, it has nothing to do with personal opinions. It has to do with trying to save the, save the, the faith in ourselves and in our families. And, you know, Francis is just doing things that need to be opposed. We need to stand up and oppose them. But he's the Pope, and that's the problem. And that's just where we are. Catholics have been in similar positions in the past. We need to stand up and publicly resist and not bicker with each well, other about who was right all along. What, mat what matters is the faith. The, the faith is, is more important than any particular occupant of the Sea of Peter. The faith has objective content. The faith consists of the eternal word and the practices and disciplines of the church that surround the eternal word and protect it from profanation and watering down. As Pope Benedict himself said, that the Pope is a custodian of the revealed word and must bind himself to the revealed word and resist using his own opinions to change the church and instead defend what the church has always taught and oppose any attempt to water it down. That's what he said within a month or two of being elected Pope. He explicitly abandoned his own ideas. So we have to forget the ideas of Francis, cling to the eternal verities of the faith, maintain the traditions that he scoffs at almost every day, and wait until he passes from the scene. But at the same time, we can't remain silent about what he does. We have to let him know that he has opposition, that he doesn't have a clear path, that he's not going to be able to score a goal against an empty net. That's all we can do. No, I love it, Chris. I couldn't, couldn't have said it better. Appreciate it ending that way. Positive note, absolutely. Rosary, scapular, keep the faith. Outlive these men. This, the, the, the church will rise again unless the world ends first. Christ the King will be triumphant. Our Lady of Fatima promised that in the end, the Immaculate Heart will triumph. We believe that firmly. So I agree with you. We need to make sure we stand up and resist and keep everything in proportion. And, and most of all, continue to pray for him and, and pray for everyone that we can keep the faith. So... I appreciate very much your thoughts. I know we got a lot more that we can say on this, and we'll be saying it, uh, you know, in the weeks to come. But thanks so much for stopping by, and we'll we'll talk to you next week. Okay, Mike. God bless. Take care. That'll do it for us, folks. Please remember, especially on our YouTube channel, if you could help us raise our profile a little bit there by subscribing. It's a free subscription. Just go ahead and subscribe to YouTube. It'll really help because we intend on putting up a lot more videos in the days to come. As a matter of fact, we've started the new Sunday sermons uh, that'll be going. So if you're subscribed to YouTube, you'll get a notification right away in your email saying that a new remnant video has gone up. So it helps you. It helps us. We, really, we want to get that number up. And also, just as I said earlier, when we, when we started off the, uh, the program today, please don't forget that we will have everything that you see on YouTube or at Vimeo will now be on a pretty nice uh, Remnant TV platform that we've set up. So we have an exclusive dedicated server just for Remnant TV on our website. And I think you're going to find that it's, uh, it's, an, it's a much more sort of family-friendly way of watching our videos. And it just helps build the Remnant's profile. So thanks very much for watching. We will see you next week. I'm Michael Matt for the Remnant Forum coming to you from Minneapolis. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.